Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you could join us today. And I'm going to give a brief overview on how we use uh, Blackboard Collaborate so we can give most of our attention to uh, Colleen. If there's time, we'll be using the talk button to, so that you can ask a question or share a comment. And that will probably be once we close out the session. And then we'll be using our laser pointer, which is the whiteboard tool. And you'll sometimes have to click on the button twice to activate the laser pointer and we'll be doing some voting and you'll vote right below your name and you'll do that by uh, clicking yes or no or A, B, C, D and most of you have found the chat window here and these are collapsible and you can drag them and resize them to fit your preference. And we want to let you know that our topic today is Math Playground Revisited. And my name is Kim Case. And as Tammy said, Lorna is not with us. She has some family commitments. And Peggy is at a funeral today of a mutual friend of ours. And our very special guest today is joining us is Colleen King. And she's been with us before. And we're very excited to have her back with us. And she is the founder of MathPlayground.com. And we're excited that Tammy is doing our closed captioning and helping moderate today, as well as Lori moderating and doing some of the uh, questioning. And we also have a live binder today. And the live binder hosts all of the links today. And we will uh, be posting that in the chat for you. And I'll get that going for you in just a moment. And um, we will update that as well after the session with all of the links that people share uh, throughout the session. So you can look for that um, for all of the links today. We do post our recordings on our archives and resources page on our website. So look for that throughout the weekend. They will be posted and uploaded. So right now, if everybody could click on the laser pointer, which is right about here, and let us know where you're located in the world on the map. We'd love to see where everybody's joining us from. Sometimes uh, when Shambles is here, he is from uh, Thailand and we see all kinds of places and if that's not working for you, you can always type in the chat as well. So please let us know where you're uh, joining us from and if you're not able to do that, uh, you can always type in the chat. So let's go ahead and go on and we'll go on to the first polling question and you're going to click on the green check or red X just below your name, not on the whiteboard. And you're going to, uh, the question is, do your students use computers in your classroom to learn um, or understand and communicate math concepts and strategies? If you do use computers to do that, please click the green check. If you don't teach math or, you're, or you don't have computers and that's not what you do or you do something other than teaching, then click on the red X. I'll give everybody a few more minutes. It's just below your name. It, you won't be clicking on the whiteboard. I'll give everybody a few more minutes before I get the polling results so you can find the voting option. Most of you know where that's the, the option is. So I'll go ahead and publish those responses. And it looks like most of us do do that. Uh, about 50% of us uh, use the computers to do that. So let me clear the options. And we're going to go ahead and go on to uh, question number two. And are you familiar with the Math Playground website and tools? 
if you are, click on the green check. And if you're not, click on the red X if you're not familiar with the Math Playground website and all of the fantastic tools she has on her website. And this again, Colleen, a great overview of kind of what to expect with uh, when she goes over her website. And let me get those results for Colleen. And it looks like um, about 33% are not familiar with her website. So um, that's great. You're going to really love to hear about our website and all of the neat tools that you can use in your classroom with your students. It's not just a game website. Um, I think you're going to find this a really valuable tool to use in your classroom. And the third question is, do you and your students use mobile devices and apps to learn and understand and communicate math concepts and strategies. If you're able to use mobile devices and apps in your classroom, click on the green check. And if you're not able to use the mobile devices yet, your AUP um, or your district and school does not allow you to use mobile devices, click on the red X. And I'll give you just a few more seconds to vote. Green check yes, red X no. Let me go ahead and get those results so we can get started. And it's kind of, I figured, um, it's a little closer than I thought. More yes than no. I thought it might be the other way around. And that's great to hear that more schools are allowing um, students and teachers to use mobile devices and apps and, and those kinds of things to help their students. So again, this is uh, we're going to be talking about the math playground. She's done some great improvements and added some new tools and things. And I think you're going to be really pleased with all the fantastic things that you're going to see and hear today. So we are very pleased to welcome Conley. And Colleen, uh, go ahead and give us a little bit more about your background. And then we'll start with the newbie question once you've introduced yourself. And we want to give you just a hearty welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today. So welcome, Colleen. Oh, thank you, Kim, so much. And welcome to everyone. And thank you so much for being here today. Um, I would classify myself as, as a math educator. I've been working with students in um, through grades K, from grades K to 12, at a math learning center that I run with my husband. Um, and we see students after school, and we uh, work with them in classes and um, privately one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we do both um, tutoring as well as um, a lot of math enhancements, um, things that they don't get in school. Um, we do a lot of hands-on mathematics, which, uh, which is often missing from their curriculum. Um, and then I, I wanted to um, start to create online activities for my students to use when they weren't coming to the center. And, and that's how Math Playground came about. It's about 12 years ago, and um, I knew nothing. I didn't know how to program. I didn't even know how a web page got online. Um, but I, I was interested enough to learn, so I, I taught myself. And, and, um, and over the years, uh, it's, it's really grown. And now there's um, a couple of million people tuning in every month to, to Math Playground. So it's, it's really, really wonderful. Um, I think it's been making a difference for, for a lot of students and, and a lot of teachers in the classroom. So the newbie question is, um, how can online games and activities help students learn math concepts and problem solving strategies? Well, one way that they can support student learning is that games make abstract ideas more concrete, more accessible. Um, they provide visuals and contacts and context that help students make sense of math concepts that may be difficult to grasp without a point of reference. And games create meaningful situations, realistic or not, for students to apply mathematical skills. This makes our learning environments much more inclusive, 
uh, multiple representations of math concepts are critical if we want to reach every student in our classrooms. Uh, I find that games can also encourage a positive attitude in our students toward math. Uh, they see math as a fun challenge rather than a, a dreadful chore. Um, math games can reduce and sometimes even eliminate the fear of failure and making mistakes that plague many students. And because of that, games can increase the overall time students spend practicing and applying math skills. And uh, one thing that's unique to games is that levels are often built into them and provide a way to personalize instruction. You can set different goals for students depending on their abilities. And um, I found that confidence increases when students work on tasks that are neither too easy nor too hard. And uh, used in the right way, I see no downside to making games uh, part of every student's math curriculum. Um, we've been using games with students, um, both ones that we make up and um, use with the students in, in a hands-on way in the classroom. But we also use a lot of the online games as well. In fact, a lot of my students over the years have um, given their input and, and helped shape a lot of the games that are on Math Playground. So today I'll be sharing a number of resources that will help students get a better understanding of math concepts and will hopefully improve their mathematical reasoning skills. Um, this is a screenshot of Math Playground's homepage. Uh, math Playground is probably one of the first websites to offer uh, a variety of supplemental math activities. In addition to games, Math Playground has manipulatives, video instruction, uh, word problems, um, math worksheets, logic puzzles, fact practice, and problem solving activities. Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to focus on three key areas, um, games, word problems, and some new apps I've developed for the iPad. Uh, on this slide, I've listed some uh, little known facts about Math Playground. But I'd like to point out one in particular, and that's uh, the one at the very bottom, um, the Kids Safe Plus certification. Uh, children's safety, as you know, is, uh, is a major concern today online. So I had Math Playground thoroughly reviewed by a children's privacy and safety expert. And um, very few websites have acquired this level of certification. And I think it's important to let you know that, that you can trust Math Playground and feel confident that your students are, are safe there. Well, here we have a snapshot of some of the math games on Math Playground. Uh, this is a very popular section of the site, as you can imagine. Um, I have more than 80 math games now, and most are aligned to the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics. In fact, there's a Common Core section of Math Playground that classifies the games according to the standards uh, for grades 1 to 6. Uh, but this is a work in progress, um, but I do have a lot of it mapped out already, and, and I'll continue to uh, correlate more games and activities to the standards. The games on the site cover um, straightforward computation practice and math facts, as well as, as higher level applications. Um, algebraic reasoning is one of my favorite areas of math, so I've built a few games and activities around this concept. Uh, for example, there are several weighing scale games um, here at the bottom, you can see Wei the Wang Doodles, which is a uh, scale weighing game. Um, in the center, there's, a, there's an algebraic reasoning puzzle game. Um, you can see the sliders next to the X detectives. Um, and I also have things like uh, function machine activities, which also um, help with algebraic reasoning. Uh, proportional thinking is covered in the game Scale Factor X, and that's um, in the second row, third from the left. This is an adventure game in which students are asked to apply their knowledge of ratio and proportion to solve problems that involve scaling objects, uh, grouping objects by a ratio rule, and figuring out distances on a map. I have a lot of fraction games on the site. The most popular one is um, in the upper left-hand corner, Escape from Fraction Manor, and, and that's going to be particularly popular coming into the Halloween season. Um, students have to find puzzle pieces and es while escaping monsters. And once they have all the pieces, they have to um, put them together in a way that creates 
true inequalities involving fractions. And they're given a visual aid to help them along with that. Um, there's a game called Triplets that um, focuses on equivalent fractions. And Gap Zappers is um, sort of an introduction to, uh, to the concept of fractions. Uh, I covered geometry in um, shape mods, which is the first row uh, on the right. Um, in that game, students are given two shapes. Uh, one is like a starting point. The other is where you have to end up. And what students have to do is, is translate, um, reflect, and rotate one shape, uh, the position of one shape, to, to find the position of the other shape. Um, there's also a design a party, which is uh, the fourth row on the left. Um, in, that, in that game, students are using area and perimeter to, to design the layout of a party. And uh, Alien Angles is another popular game in which um, students have to estimate angles, and then um, they use a protractor to, to uh, actually measure the angle. And we also have games related to number bonds and, and computation. And please feel free to interrupt me at any point um, and ask questions. I'd be happy to pause and, and answer them. Uh, in addition to the more traditional math games, uh, Math Playground has more than 75 thinking games. And these include logic puzzles and strategy games. And these games are, are rich in spatial reasoning, problem solving, and programming principles. And I, I believe these skills are a necessary part of a well-rounded math education. And I've included links to uh, a few example games in the live binder. Now, these games are a lot of fun, but, but I want you to know that they're also aligned to uh, Common Core Math. In fact, the, the standards for mathematical practice, um, that section outlines the expertise that teachers should develop in their students. Uh, for example, um, MP1 states that students showing mathematical proficiency, students who show mathematical proficiency make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. They plan a solution pathway rather than simply jumping into a solution attempt. They evaluate their progress and change course if necessary. And this is exactly what students are doing when they play these types of games. So it, it's important to provide your students with opportunities to problem solve in this way. Now, if you're using Math Playground games with your students, please feel free to let me know. I'd, I'd love to hear how they're being used in, in your classrooms. And uh, I respond to every email I get. So um, you know, just feel free to, to drop me a line. Does anyone have any questions about the, the games on Math Playground? OK, um, well, now I'd like to talk about an area of math that often confuses students uh, from as early as second grade all the way through high school and beyond. And uh, that would be word problems. Oh, if only there were a game for that, right? I'm working on it, working on it. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at a typically confusing word problem. Um, let's read through it and think about how you might try to solve it. The computer club used five-eighths of their membership funds to buy a printer. After spending one-third of the remaining money on ink, they had $120 left. How much money did the computer club have at first? Now, there are a couple of challenging parts to this problem that, that I see, and you might see others. Uh, let me know in the chat room. Um, the first is that we don't know the starting amount. And that usually disorients students. We like to begin a problem with a known amount. And then we want to add to it or subtract from it, multiply it or divide it. But we can't do that here, and it can be very unsettling. The second problem I see is that uh, two of the three numbers in the problem are fractions. And fractions are, are not very popular these days. Um, <laughs> I searched for the word fraction on Twitter recently. And uh, I just couldn't believe what um, young people and not so young people have to say about this topic. Uh, clearly, fractions are a major source of angst. Uh, it was quite an eye-opener. 
So, um, so the mere mention of fractions or, or seeing fractions in a word problem uh, typically frightens or scares off students. And the third difficulty I see is that the problem talks about a fraction of a remainder. A student who is not clear about what that means can wander down the wrong path on this problem uh, pretty easily. But I'm going to show you a way to solve this word problem that is highly visual, very concise, and incredibly empowering. Here it comes. OK. All you do is start with a block. Now, this block is going to represent the total money, which is the unknown starting amount. The size of our block doesn't matter because well, first of all, we don't know anything about that starting amount, so we really can't make any connection between the size of this block and the starting quantity. We just want it to be large enough to work with. So that's the first step. We're told that the club used 5 eighths of the money. That means we need to divide this block into eight equal pieces. Five of those pieces or five-eighths of the whole block were used to buy a printer. The other three blocks, or three-eighths of the whole block, represent the remaining money. So a picture begins to emerge. And now we can add in a few more details. One-third of the remaining money was spent on ink. That means that the other two blocks represent the $120 that was left. I need to pause here for a second. Can everyone see um, if I point to something on the slide? Just make sure that you hold on your left mouse button. So you, you can see now? Or no? If you click uh, on one of, like, one of the uh, laser pointer, like the hand, Oh, OK. Now you can? Yes. OK, I see. OK, thank you. OK, so one third of the remaining money was spent on ink. And that means the other two blocks represent the $120 that were remaining. Now, this is, this is the key step. We've now established a connection between the model and a numerical quantity in the word problem. And the problem can easily be solved now. So let's see how that works. From this point on, we can use proportional reasoning. We know that two blocks have a value of $120. So one block would, be, would have a value that's half that amount, or $60. We want to know the value of all eight blocks, the total money. So we just multiply the value of one block by eight, and that's $480. Now, some students might notice that two blocks is one-fourth of eight blocks. And they could skip this middle step altogether and just multiply four times $120 and get 480. But it's all based on proportional reasoning in this problem. Now, this is a problem-solving strategy that's often associated with Singapore math. I've been teaching this method to my own students for about 12 years now. I created thinking blocks, which is actually the, the program I'm showing you now, um, because I wanted to make this problem solving strategy more visual and interactive. But mostly, I wanted as many kids as possible to know about it. It's a very powerful tool that students can adapt to a wide variety of word problems. And honestly, I, I think it's invaluable. I think every student needs this in their tool set. And kids can go far with this method very quickly. I have 9 and 10 year old students that can understand and solve algebra problems uh, from an actual Algebra 1 book using thinking blocks. And former students who have taken the SAT have told me they solved a lot of problems using what they learned with the thinking blocks program. The thinking blocks tutorials teach students how to model word problems involving addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, fractions, ratio, and proportion. Students can move the blocks and build their own models. The tutorial component makes it easy for students to jump right in. It's a lot like solving a puzzle, but it's just about impossible to fail. 
Thinking Blocks has built-in hints that guide students from beginning to end. And the way we just solved that fraction problem is typical of a Thinking Blocks guided tutorial. Now, Thinking Blocks has been available online for several years. But I upgraded the programs this summer with some new features. So if you've tried it before, I think you'll like the improvements. The big news, though, is that Thinking Blocks is now available for the iPad. Each Thinking Blocks program covers six different models. A seventh option randomizes those models. At the computation step, there is a writing tool and a calculator. Progress is saved even when the app is completely closed down, and a certificate is created showing the various models completed by the student. Now, these apps are, are currently free, uh, but, but not for long. Um, <laughs> they're free until September 15. Uh, then the price will be $1.99 per app, and, but there will be a 50% discount for schools. And I'm sure from time to time, I'll, I'll just make them free again. So please download the apps and give them a try with your students. Um, and let me know how it goes. And if you download the apps, I would really appreciate if you could rate and review them for me. Um, that's uh, very important in, in gaining visibility in, in the App Store. There's another component to the online Thinking Blocks program that will soon be available as an app, too. Uh, this program makes it possible to model almost any kind of word problem. This is a more open-ended tool. Students can manipulate the blocks to a much greater extent than they can in the tutorials. Blocks can be duplicated, cut, or divided into equal parts. They can be broken into pieces and put back together. There are built-in problems covering six different major topics. But teachers can also cut and paste in their own, uh, you know, right there into the program. Students can check their final answer, and they can view a model, which is, which is really handy. So they can, they can compare the model they built against one that the program builds. And there's more than one way to build a model. Um, and as, as kids become, as students become more proficient with the modeling tool and with thinking blocks in general, they'll start to develop their own ways of, of creating these models. Also on the website, you'll find videos describing 36 example problems spanning um, nine different topics. The videos provide step-by-step -step instruction and are meant to um, help you get started with the modeling tool. So does anyone have any questions or comments about thinking blocks? Too awesome for words, right? <laughs> OK, in addition to thinking blocks, I've created a few other apps I'd like to show you. Equation Creations is my most recent app. With this app, students can explore the fun side of math. And yes, there is a fun side. Students use math equations to draw spirograph designs, and they can also animate three different scenes just using mathematics. Here are some examples of what students can create with the drawing program. To make these designs, students are actually changing the radius of two different circles, one that is fixed in position and one that moves around the other. Uh, they're also changing the position of the pen. Students can explore what happens when the circles have the same radius or when one is double or triple the size of the other. The results can be surprising. And it's a great, um, it's a great way to begin a discussion. I've included some examples for students to try and provided values for, for the different variables. And these are um, the different sorts of designs that occur when you change the variables around. In the animation part of the app, students control the action in different scenes. This one is a rock concert. So math equations are actually controlling components of this rock concert. For example, math equations control the scale of the mural in the back. This mural will increase and decrease in size, it, and it rotates, and it varies how, how quickly it pulsates. And all of that is controlled by um, by math equations. These spotlights are also controlled by math. Students can vary the angle of rotation and how fast the spotlights swing. 
And the audience is also under the control of a math equation. The audience bounces up and down and moves left and right to the music. So you can make the audience sway back and forth to easy listening, or pretend they're at a heavy metal concert and have the audience bounce up and down frenetically. It's just kind of a, a fun way to apply math and uh, to, you know, to use it to do something creative. In this scene, students control the action on a planet in a galaxy far, far away. Um, they can control the path of the UFO. This rocket ride can travel around a circle, or it can be made into an ellipse. And the speed at which the rocket travels can be controlled. The arms and legs of this robot alien are also controlled by math equations. And this becomes kind of humorous, because the robot can walk on its knees and take on other strange positions. But again, this is a fun way for, for kids to explore what happens when they change variables. And, um, and I'm hoping it'll, it'll make them more curious about math and, and want to know more. Now, the math in this app is hidden in the control panels that the students use to, to change the variables and make things happen. And I did that because I didn't want math to be a barrier to the playful parts of the app. But I created a section for those who want to learn a bit about the math behind the fun. So in Where's the Math, there are five sections. And it begins with a very simple introduction to, to the circle. Just some very basic facts. And there's actually a, something that they can um, play with to, to change the uh, radius and therefore circumference of the circle. From there, a problem is posed. When an object moves around a circle, how do we determine its position? What are its x and y coordinates? coordinates? And that's the problem we're trying to solve here. And, and solving this problem is what makes all the action take place in the drawing and animation components. So to answer that, students explore a function machine. That's what I have uh, showing in this slide. And they are introduced to uh, the very special functions needed to solve this circular motion problem. And those special functions are, are sine and cosine, um, trig functions. Now, this is, this is very advanced for most kids, but I think it's introduced in a, in a gentle way. And I think it's, it's understandable. If, if a student has interest in why these things are happening in the app or, or how they're happening, I think they'll understand the explanation uh, with some guidance from a teacher or parent. So they're being introduced to these advanced concepts in a fun and engaging way. From there, we apply what was learned to what they experienced in the app, moving with circles and drawing with circles. Now, this app is um, 99 cents in the App Store. But I'd like to offer promo codes to two lucky winners in the chat room. So um, I believe either Kim or Tammy are going to, to help with that, I hope. You know, I've lost the chat. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm stuck. I'm way back at like 12.10 in the chat. I'm so sorry. I bet you I missed a lot of questions. I apologize. For no, that. no, it's um, not a problem. Uh, <laughs> if you're ready, we can definitely do that now or later. Sure, you yeah, yeah let's do that now. I, okay. I need a water break. <laughs> okay, great. Let me go ahead and go to uh, my randomizer. But what I need everybody to do, if you would like to um, to win one of the apps, I need everybody to click on the hand so that you get a number. So go ahead and click on the hand. I know it's going to be dinging, 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 dinging. And Tammy and Lori, that includes you too. Um, if you want to uh, get one of the uh, the apps, go ahead and click on the hand. I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my browser so that we can go to the randomizer. And I didn't see how many uh, numbers were there. Looks like Looks only like 11, 11 people. Does every anybody else want to get in the drawing for the uh, one of the apps? 12. Okay. 
Those are some good odds. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has a great chance of winning. Let me see if this will work. I may not have the right uh, version. Good luck. Okay, let's see if this is the right version. Okay. Was it 12, the last one? 13. Okay. Let me go back up. Okay. Number. Okay, between 1 and 13. And it looks like number 3 and 4 were the winners. 3 and 4. So, let me go back. And Paula, all right, and Elizabeth. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. All right. Um, so how would I get the promo codes to Elizabeth and Paula? Uh, you can, um, they can, um, how about direct chat? If you double click on their names, it'll create a little tab at the bottom and only they'll see it. Well, moderators can see it, but we won't use it. Yeah. Um, but just double click on, on, you can actually, well, we'll just do one at a time. Double click on one of their names, give the promo code, and then double click on the other one's name, and then post it. Just make sure you post it into the tab that has their name on it, not the room tab. So right underneath where you type in a text message, you'll see another tab that will have their names on it once you double click on it. And then post okay. it is, after you click okay? on their names. Okay, is it okay if I do that at the end? Sure, or you can give me your email and then... Yeah, that, that might be easier. Yeah. Um, let me just type that in. Okay, and I have their emails too now, so um, <laughs> we can find each other. Great. Um, yes. I'll have them to you uh, within... Uh, the hour or so. There you go. Okay. No problem. Congratulations. Okay. Moving along. Super. Elizabeth okay, the next and, and Paula, sure. congrats. Okay, the, the next app I want to talk about is actually the very first app I ever made. And um, Maria Juskova had a had a big role in this. She helped me uh, kind of work through a lot of the math ideas in this app. Um, so I, I do a lot of algebraic reasoning activities with my younger students, and, and they really have a great time with it. Uh, we, we do a lot of puzzle solving. And I wanted to try to bring that experience to other students. So in this app, we're on planet Zog, which is inhabited by little creatures called Zogs. And the Zogs are going to be sent on shuttle missions. But there's a specific payload uh, or an amount to meet, and we need to know the weight of the Zogs to determine which ones will be part of the crew. The Zogs have a mischievous side, though, and will only step on the scale with other Zogs. So this leads to a series of challenging algebra puzzles. So here's an example from level four. The main puzzle is in the center of the app. Right above each scale, you can see the latest puzzle, con or the, the last puzzle configuration. So this puzzle is already in progress. We've, we've already done a step, and now, now we're at this place in the, in the puzzle solving strategy. Below the puzzle are cards that represent three mathematical actions. Now to solve any set of simultaneous equations, and this is in general, not just this game, there are really only three possible moves. You can multiply or divide the equations. And that's like, we, we consider that scaling up and scale or scaling down in the game. And that's represented by the first block. 
or the, the first card. You can add or subtract equations, and that's represented by the third card. Um, so what, what we're doing is combining groups. Um, we're combining them through addition or, or subtraction. And the third operation or, or mathematical process is simplifying the equations by removing known values. And so um, when you use this card, when you apply this card to the puzzle, you take away um, Zogs whose values have been determined. So in this puzzle, we have uh, three pink Zogs that have a weight of 18. And we have a green Zog and a pink Zog whose weight is 13. So the next step in this puzzle would be to scale down this equation. And that means we want to divide by three. And that would leave us with one pink triang triangular Zog with a weight of six. And now we have a known value. And we'll apply that to this pink Zog, which would also have a value of six. And then when we subtract that value from both sides of the equation, we're left with the value of the green Zog. And you can undo each step or reset the entire puzzle as you go along. And here's a more challenging example from level 11. Here we have three groups of Zogs. In the upper levels, there are several different pathways that you can take in order to solve a puzzle. And that, I think, is, is part of the fun. Is, is, um, not everyone's going to, to travel the same road to get, to get their correct answer. And that also makes a, lot of, for, makes for a lot of interesting discussion in the classroom, because each student can talk about the path that they chose to, uh, to take to solve the problem. So for example, in this problem, um, I would probably work, at this point in the puzzle, I would work on this third scale. You notice that there are um, three hexagon zogs and three triangle zogs. They have a weight of 30. Even though they're not all the same type of zog, the fact that there are three of each kind means that I can divide this entire equation by three. So again, I'm going to apply um, the scaling operation. And I'm going to divide by three. But that's not the only way to proceed. We could have, um, let's see. Oh, you know what we could do? I noticed that there are six hexagon zogs on this scale. If I double um, the equation on the right, I'll have six hexagon zogs on this scale. Then I can, I can subtract these zogs from the ones on this scale, and I'll be left with only triangle zogs. So you can see you can, you can take different approaches to solving it. Once the weight of each zog is determined, students are given the total weight for this particular shuttle mission, or, or the payload. Their job is to figure out how many of each kind of Zog can go on the mission. So for example, um, this was a puzzle in which we found that the weight of the green Zog was 8, and the weight of the purple Zog was 9. And the total payload allowed for this mission is 58. So we have to figure out how many Zogs weighing 8 and how many Zogs weighing 9 will together equal 58. And students choose a Zog and then just move the slider to change the number of Zogs. And, and that will appear on the scale up here. On completion of a level, the Zogs blast off into outer space and a new level begins. And here's a screenshot of the levels. They're color and shape coded according to the number of scales in the puzzle. So for example, level one only has one scale. That's the very beginning level. That makes sense. Then from levels two to nine, we have two scales. From levels 10 to 19, all the problems involve three scales. And levels 20 to 24 are four scale puzzles. And they can get quite tricky. Now, I made an app that's a companion tool for the shuttle mission math game. It's called Visual Algebra Puzzles. And I envision teachers using this in the classroom in conjunction with the math game. So teachers can actually create their own puzzles, and the class can work together to solve them. So 
teachers may want to use this actually before using the game to go through the strategies with students, start out with very simple problems, work, work, on, work on a lot of simple puzzles, and then build up from there to uh, three and four um, scales at a time, and, um, and then go into the game. Or you can just have the, the students jump into the game and see how they do, and, and if you need to have them step out and kind of work together as a group to go over the strategies, and you can do it that way as well. And I suppose um, it could really be a standalone app as well, but you'd have to kind of look at the information about the strategies, I, I think. Um, the first screen is where you build your puzzle. You would choose the number of teams, uh, one through four. You would select which zogs you want to appear in the puzzle, and then you select a weight range, and then just create your puzzle. And that's it. You're ready to go. The problem solving steps are identical to those seen in the game. And this is a great way to get your students thinking about equations, equality, and variables. And uh, we have a lot of fantastic discussions in my classroom with, with puzzles like this. And this app um, is free to download, as was the Shuttle Mission Math Game, is also a free app. So please uh, give them a try with your students. And I have one final app. It's called Dare to Share Fairly. Um, it's not a game. This is more like a manipulative. I made it to help students understand long division better. You can make up your own problems or have the app generate a problem for you based on certain criteria, like um, the maximum dividend and if you want remainders or not. So students are given place value blocks that represent the dividend, and the green maths represent the divisor. When an exchange needs to be made, for example, a hundreds block needs to be converted into 10 and tens blocks, students would drag the hundreds block um, to the exchange area. You tap this button and you get your 10 tens box. So students can view the actual long division steps at any point. The algorithm shows where in the problem any exchanges were made. So for example, at this step, we had to regroup hundreds. And students can also check their work. And this app is, is free to download. So that brings us up to date with uh, my work at Math Playground. Uh, going forward, I plan to make more iPad apps and hopefully start developing Android apps as well. I have some ideas for more visual learning games like, like Shuttle Mission Math. And I'd like to design math activities specifically for the Common Core. And I'm also thinking about providing online math help for students and, and possibly professional development for, for teachers. So lots to look forward to. Definitely. There's so many things. And these are ways that you can contact um, Colleen with her great. Definitely take note of the website. You'll definitely want to do that. And ways that you can contact yeah. her. Go ahead. I'd also like to say, um, uh, please visit the Facebook page, because I announced new games there. And we'll be giving away more promo codes over the next few months. Um, I'm also on Edmodo, and I'll be adding more to the library there for you to use. Um, and you can follow me personally on Twitter. Um, I, I go by my, my own name, but I, um, I, I think I tend to Twitter mostly or tweet about, um, about Math Playground. And um, if you search for Math Playground on iTunes, you'll find all of my apps in, in one place there. So uh, thank you so much for coming to this event. I, I hope I've shared some good resources with you. And you'll be able to use Math Playground with your students. And again, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or want to give feedback. Um, I respond to every email. And uh, thanks again. Appreciate it. And we will take questions. I'm going to go ahead and very quickly close out the show. I know we had some uh, issues uploading since I had a new computer. I didn't have all of the programs uh, downloaded. Um, we want to let you know that Steve Hargadon will be interviewing <coughs> Doug Johnson on September 10th, Michelle Cordy on September the 11th, and Kevin Jones on September 12th, Christine Gross will on September 25th, and October 
uh, first on Will Richardson, and on October 8th, um, he'll be talking with Yovo Badash. I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name. I probably did. So I totally apologize for that. We have some things in the works on for our shows on September the 14th, but we want to let you know that um, September the 1st, 21st, we will not be having a show um, so that everybody can attend the Global STEM. Uh, it's like the TEDx conference, um, but Steve Hargadon and uh, I think Audrey Waters, um, a group of people along with Steve Hargadon, are going to be putting on a fantastic free global conference about STEM. Um, and it's free. You can attend all of the sessions that you want. If you miss some of them, of course, you can watch the recording. Uh, so that will be coming up, but we won't have a show on the 21st. But we'll be back with Zoe Midler, and she'll be our feature teacher on the 28th. And we would love for you to nominate a featured teacher. And that is in the live binder. And any time that you uh, need that link, you can go to the live binder. And the live binder is on our archives and uh, resources page on our website at any time. Once you exit today's session, a survey will open. We'd love to get your feedback. And about future topics and things that, about today's uh, session that you liked. And again, we apologize for the difficulties at the very beginning. We want to respect your time. Well, we know that if you have to go, we understand. But we want to uh, make sure that you're able to get your uh, certificate or participation by completing the survey. Just fill out that. Uh, your name and email address and give us a few uh, days since Peggy's not with us today. Um, so, and any time that you watch one of the archives, the videos, you can also fill out that same survey link at the bottom of this slide and you can request a certificate for that archive that you watch. You can also subscribe to any of our iTunes U archives, uh, the MP3, the MP4, or you can subscribe to our RSS feed um, the same way, the, RS, the MP3 and the MP4. And we want to thank Colleen again for joining us. And she is one of our great friends. And thanks to Steve for our great founder and leader and mentor and to Weebly for providing our website and to each of you for always providing such great, great, great uh, comments and questions and uh, to Blackboard for allowing us to meet to have these fantastic discussions. So now we're going to go back to our question slide um, and take those questions anything that we um, might have missed. If you'd like to take the mic, we can give you the mic, or you can continue typing them in the chat, either one, or you can email Colleen if if you have to go. We do understand, and we want to be uh, cognizant of your time. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Lori to uh, take over the questions to ask of um, calling. Thanks, Kim. The first one I have is, uh, do you find that things are changing, that kids get as much out of virtual manipulatives as hands-on manipulatives? Oh my gosh, we were just having this discussion this past week um, that about 10 years ago, we often talked about how virtual manipulatives would never ever be able to do what, what the hands-on uh, manipulatives do, but it's not the case. Kids are living their lives virtually in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. and they're very comfortable um, interacting with things in that manner. Um, you know, I mean, there certainly are students who still need that kinesthetic component to learning, absolutely. I, I, I have worked with students like that, 
But I'd, I'd say for the um, great majority of them, um, it's just as effective. Thanks. Are there ninth to 12th grade applications? Are there high school student applications? Um, very few. I, I have a game on the site called Project Trig, which, um, which involves um, velocity and, and um, more high school level type math equations. Um, actually, that, that's pre-calc level. Um, so that's something that could be explored. I, I have um, the, the hardcore math component of that is actually part of it. Um, but uh, apart from that, I think my target audience is, is grades uh, 2 to maybe 7 or 8. OK. Speaking of grades, are the games leveled, or are there grade recommendations for the games? You know, I, I get that question a lot, and, and I've been reluctant to do that because the idea behind Math Playground, um, and you can almost tell by its name, is that I, I wanted it to be a place that kids could just come in and explore whatever looked interesting to them. It didn't matter that they were in grade three, but this game was for grade five, or you know, maybe the student was in grade seven, but this grade tar this game targets grade four. I didn't want any of that to matter. And I just wanted the kids to come in and just just enjoy it all and just try everything. So I've I've stayed away from that, but I, I understand how important that is to, you know, a teacher working with a group of fourth or fifth graders and, and wanting the right um, games to use with their students. So I, I don't have something like that worked out now, except actually the Common Core section. Um, there should be a link in the live binder to the Common Core. That's probably the only space where I align games in that manner. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll try to do that um, even with, with the other games as well. And that actually answers the next question, was where was the link for the Common Core aligned oh. game? <laughs> so in the live binder. Um, let's see. Can you plug in a standard and the games that use that standard, will they pop up? Is there a search capability that way? Um, no, it's definitely not that advanced. Um, you would look for your grade level, and then I, I have the games um, classified to the main standards. Um, so it, I don't have a whole lot classified, so it's pretty easy to sift through it at this point. But yes, that's a great idea. It's something I should look into doing, for sure. Mm -hmm. Does it record for more than one student on the iPad? Oh. Um, can, can more than one student use the same iPad for the same game? Uh, not without losing the information. So, so no, it's not stored for, for, individual stu for more than one student at a time. Um, you would have to reset that app. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you were connected on Edmodo. Would you mind sharing that in chat? Oh, sure. Um, I just have to quickly look that up. <laughs> Sorry about that. That might be That's in the okay. live binder. I'm not sure. It could be in the live binder. It wasn't on the, the page when you were sharing right. the other yeah. methods. And I think that's um, when somebody asked. OK, I found it, actually. Good. Uh, here it is. There you go. Thank you. Um, what hardware is needed in the classroom? Oh, just a, a standard desktop computer or laptop. Oh, if you want to use the apps, you'd need an iPad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those were the questions that I captured. I, I haven't seen was, any others in chat. There was one about oh. um, about making the, the games that are so visual available to, to maybe students who have visual difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know who asked that question. When I was going quickly through the chat, I, it just I missed popped that out one. at me. Um, that's something I'd like to discuss with whoever asked that question. And, and um, if they have ideas on how to do that, I, I'm very interested. So again, you can email me on that. Thanks, Colleen. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Lori. And if we missed anything or something just came to mind, we would love to answer your questions and make sure that uh, we get your questions answered. So um, just let us know before we go for the day.
uh, you can type them in the chat or uh, just raise your hand, clicking on the hand, and then we'll give you the mic. Tammy, go ahead. I like to build the games too, so I was just curious, what, do you, what are you using to build your apps? Um, I've been using Adobe Air with the um, Flash program, and it converts Flash activities um, to an iPad format with, with uh, you know, a little bit of um, work on your end. It's not a, a magic wand, but um, it does a nice job of, of allowing you to build your games or activities in Flash and then uh, convert them to a format that is acceptable to Apple. I'd be happy to help you out if you wanted to talk about that, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. And thank you to everybody for asking questions. Are there any other questions that um, we didn't get answered before we end for the day? Looks like they're kind of winding down. You can always contact um, Colleen and her website and the Facebook page or Twitter. Um, and please uh, don't forget Paula and Elizabeth to contact her for your codes. And congratulations to you. And thank you for your generosity, Colleen, for sharing this with our uh, participants, we always appreciate that. Oh, and thank again, you so much. Thank you for inviting me on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, we love it. We love it. And Harvey's asking, what's the best way to find about technology in the classroom? And I would say Twitter just and, and coming to our sessions, just sharing. And, Definitely. Um, yeah, just connecting with one another. If anybody else has an idea. We meet every Saturday, Harvey, so you're welcome. Yes, um, attend the STEM con conference. That would be great. I don't have the uh, website, but I believe the STEM conference is in the um, live binder. But let, let me get that live binder link for you, uh, for everyone. But um, for those who are watching the the live, watching the recorded session or in the live session. Ah, the reform symposium is coming up too, and then the uh, K twelve online conference is coming up, and the global online com the global conference is coming up there are a lot of conferences coming up that are free and online um, and if you can't make it you just uh, watch the recording but that's how you meet people and connect and ask questions and 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 make those connections it's just asking questions and talking with people that's how um, how we've all done it with each other is just making those connections, asking questions, and, and talking with each other. So be sure to reach out to us and connect with all of us on Twitter. We'll be happy to, to help you out. So it uh, looks like things have kind of wound up. Uh, we want to thank you again, Colin. Um, we're going to have a great session next week. We're finishing up the details for that. So look forward to that session. And have a wonderful weekend, everybody. See you online. Take care, everybody. And thank you for coming today. And thanks so much for your help today, um, Tammy and Lori. And thank you for joining us, Colleen. Take care, You're everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.